Um, okay, so this is a the final session. So I'm going to wish everyone a formal welcome. This is the final session of Wine Summit 2020. And it's just such a pleasure to welcome everyone virtually in your own homes and to introduce myself quickly. My name is Nikki Gravman and I'm the country co-director of Ashoka UK in Ireland and I will be the moderator today. I want to make sure that everyone can hear me because I'm hearing a bit of a lag. So if anyone can just message, we're all good. And every participant is here. So I'm gonna keep going in that case. Mm -hmm. um, as you've all seen from the agenda, everyone, we have this incredible panel lined up. So in no particular order, we've got Carol Dorsey, president of Beckling Green, who's gonna be joining us. And we have Elizabeth White from the British Council in Egypt. We have Teresa Shaheen from Yale. We have Rana Aku from the Womanity Foundation. We've got Natalie Rickstead, CEO and founder of Black Fox Philanthropy. And we've got Miriam Bengoa, Executive Director of the Chanel Foundation. And then we've got Abdul Rahman Alahawani from the Asfari Foundation. I practiced your name, Abed, because, you know, we... You can call me Abed. I can call me Abed to make life easier. <laughs> um, so for those of you listening in, if this is your first interaction with WISE, WISE is Ashoka's global women's initiative for social entrepreneurship, which aims to elevate the number, knowledge, and power of women social entrepreneurs and to shift the paradigm of success in the ecosystem, increasing the recognition and support for scaling deep impact. Now, the Wise Up series has been set up to create a movement in order to change the narrative. It's not about men versus women, but it's really about redefining success and introducing a new set of measurements that give credit to the way social entrepreneurs and specifically women social entrepreneurs innovate, lead and drive impact. So in these series, you will have seen the incredible work of some women social entrepreneurs, because the point is that we want to share their stories. And so for those of you who need just a little recap, because I'm sure you guys would have heard these three terms come up in the last three days about scaling deep and scaling up and scaling out. And just to recap, when we say scaling deep, and we're going to be referring to this term quite a bit in this session, it's about giving more weight to shaping culture, beliefs, norms, patterns of behavior in society. And it means transforming mindsets, relationships, value systems, norms, so that that impact has a deep and long lasting effect on communities and future generations. Scaling deep is the strongest and perhaps most unrecognized by the mainstream in our ecosystem. And in the global impact study that we did with Ashoka, we found that women social entrepreneurs tend to prioritize scaling deeply in their work. Scaling up, that focuses on changing laws, policies. It might look a light on action from the outside, but this type of work can affect millions of people. You may have heard from our Ashoka fellow Sue Riddleston in another session talking about the way that she led influence in the global policy and the development of the sustainable development. Or scaling out, which is the dominant paradigm that we seem to exist in in the social entrepreneurship ecosystem, where the focus is on impacting the greatest number of people through replication and geographic dissemination. This is often scaled through franchise and models. So with that very short backdrop, we will aim in the next 90 minutes to do three things. First, we want to explore how, as we work to rebuild after COVID-19, how scaling deep methodologies and the women innovators often leading them can be better supported by the innovation ecosystem. Second, our panelists are gonna share models for scaling deep partnerships. And third, we want to discuss opportunities for collaboration between different decision makers in the ecosystem to shift this current paradigm of success towards recognizing and supporting scaling deep impact. So I wanna get out of the way, but I first wanna highlight why is this conversation important right now? 
Because right now, we find ourselves in the biggest societal shakeup since the Second World War. The pandemic has changed the way we work, socialize, and behave in order to save the most vulnerable in our society. But at the same time, we're witnessing historic moments in the Black Lives Matter movement. We're witnessing moments like Friday for the Future marches that have mobilized millions of young people. And what this is showing us is that change requires everyone to participate. It's not a single entity or a single stakeholder group or the private sector or the general public or government or social entrepreneurs that can solve these issues we all face. It requires a mindset shifting of society, setting new cultural norms around participation, who gets to make the change and what success looks like. I read that Churchill once said, don't waste the good crisis. And I think it's this exact sentiment which has inspired this conversation. How do we use this moment in time to change the framework in the impact ecosystem to elevate the power and the place of scaling deep as a methodology for impact so that we can galvanize the approach to protect communities and economies from negative consequences of COVID-19? And then what are these concrete steps that each stakeholder group can take towards that so we can build back society better? So I'm gonna get out because now the plan is I'm gonna ask each of our incredible panelists a question to get their personal reflections on this. And then we're gonna open up to a discussion on the innovation ecosystem at large and how we can drive partnerships with strong deep impact. And then our closing remarks will be more by Iman Birbas, the founder of WISE. So I hope that sounds like a good plan, everyone. And without further ado, I would just love to start with, I think, Rana. Rana, you have had 15 years of being in both private, public, and non-governmental sectors. You started your career in the Dubai government, leading the development of Future Leaders Program. And in 2012, you founded Painting Pink, a truly collaborative initiative with private, public, and non-governmental institutions like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're so excited to have you here and really interested in your perspective of, have you observed an increased weight placed on this franchise model, the scaling out as opposed to scaling deep models? Or how have you seen the work that you're doing in media projects, shifting mindsets and norms in the understanding of what successful impact looks like? And I'm going to leave it there and hand over to you. Great. Um, thank you, Nikki. And, um, Sorry, can you, can you all hear me? Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Uh, great, thank you very much. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be among you all and, and thank you for uh, you know, hosting this you know, fantastic session. Um, I think to kind of answer that question, um, I'm going to have to give a bit of context and, and background um, uh, a little bit on just very quickly on media in general, so that you kind of you know able to uh, really understand maybe our approach or humanity's approach, to, you know, towards it. Um, if we look globally uh, and more specifically regionally, which is more relevant to humanity's work in media in MENA, we know that the whole topic of gender in media is um, you know quite a heavy issue it's it's quite a uh, a big uh, take uh, you know or a big a big task to take on uh, so if we look at global numbers we know that about 24 percent of uh, people that are seen heard or read about um, are women uh, and only about 19 percent of expert sources that media speaks to are women and these are global numbers. So if we actually bring them back to MENA, we expect the numbers to worsen, uh, given that MENA lags obviously on um, gender indicators across the board. So uh, the representation of not only women's stories and perspectives, but even their expert opinions um, can be considerably less. I think another kind of um, really um, you know, stark statistic that when I, you know, kind of when we started doing the work in media is, is about, 4% of global stories, and that's everything that you see in media. So about 4% um, of, of stories, of opinion editorials, of articles, of any, anything that you see in media actually challenges gender stereotypes. So that means that about 96% of everything that we see and hear and read and uh, interact with online actually reinforces 
uh, gender roles and, and what you know the society expects of uh, women and, and men. So we've got a, quite a big issue um, at hand. Now, having said that, we know, and, and when you were talking, Nikki, about scaling deep, we know, and changing norms and changing attitudes and behaviors, we know that media is the tool uh, to be able to really uh, do that because the way that media operates is that it really sets the agenda in a sense it makes uh, us think about what we should be caring about and what we should be reading about um, so it sets the agenda and then it normalizes as well in a, in a sense it's um it identifies ways in which uh, a group is considered within the norm and a group that isn't considered within the norm so between norm setting and agenda setting, media plays a humongous role in um, shaping attitudes and behaviors and, and so on and so forth. So that is kind of just the, you know, the quick kind of context and background. Um, now at Womanity, we have started working with media in MENA specifically, uh, you know, since about 10 years ago. And, and we started off with uh, Radio Nisa, which was uh, and still is the, uh, you know, only woman led, woman focused radio station in the region. Um, and it was quite a model that was rooted in scaling deep. This is a model that uh, looked at being very much part of the local community, uh, being very much focused on, um, uh, you know, a, a very specific, um, uh, you know, audience, uh, you know, target, if we can say it from both men and women. Uh, it got very much embedded as part of the partnership kind of, or the media uh, ecosystem or the media landscape as the go-to platform for, um, you know, women's topics in general uh, in Palestine. So it was very much a model that was built and envisioned about, you know, scaling deep. Um, but obviously it is, it is a traditional model um, uh, when, when it comes to media. So it is traditional media. It is, it is a radio platform, uh, you know, similarly to how a TV, uh, you know, a TV station would be mainstream media. Um, quickly after that, actually with Humanity, we, we, we started uh, looking at, um, you know, kind of, something, another tool that we are able to reach youth um, in the region. And that went, that, that happened through uh, creation of a digital animation series. I think the point where there was um, a, a bit of a, sh a shift or not a shift, but actually of what you define as a really of, you know, a scaling deep happened in 2019 uh, when we realized that in order for us to actually be able to get that impact and be able to really get that shift of norms and behaviors within our target bullseye audience, we really have to go deeper. Uh, and so after three seasons of working on a radio series and a digital animation series, in 2019, we continued the work of actually producing uh, a show because that's how we have historically been trying to tackle that, which is, you know, kind of production of shows that we can put online where we bring out these gender stereotypes, um, you know, particularly targeting the young population in the region. But what we realized in 2019 that in order for us to kind of go deeper, we have to kind of expand from that one show, which was that one tool, to actually be able to provide um, more options to our, uh, and, and what we did as well is that we went even more specific as to who our target audience is. So we kind of honed in to a very particular set of, um, you know, young people in the region. Previously, we wanted to attract youth in MENA, but now we continuously talk about the movable middle. Uh, and that became our niche kind of target audience for the content that, would we, that we would be producing. And so we expanded as well from going into just uh, and producing uh, and distributing um, a, a show, um, you know, a 10 episode show uh, online to actually going to that movable middle, that, that kind of bullseye's audience uh, with um, more content uh, and not only more content in terms of more shows, but varied kind of content. So we're going with editorial content and we're going with uh, other forms of visual content, not just the series. So we are able to kind of put out there, um, if you can say more than one product, uh, Kind of more niche specific target audience so between kind of focusing ourselves even more at our uh, you know target audience and being able to spread uh, and increase uh, the content and the way in which we are reaching these audiences in we were able to kind of scale deeper so that we are uh, so that we can eventually get to that um, 
you know, impact the way that we uh, have envisioned it and the way that we want to see it. So I think these were kind of the two strategies that we really relied on and that saw us creating, um, you know, We Mean Media in 2019, which is a platform that we envision can become the go-to platform for any content to create uh, and distribute that touches uh, women and gender topics and gender stereotypes in the region. Uh, and that became kind of uh, the overarching strategy as opposed to just looking at um, just a, a specific, uh, you know, series or, or a specific show or a specific visual, uh, you know, content that we want to produce. So that became, uh, in 2019, that was kind of the culmination of the thinking so that we are actually moving deeper into it. Um, but it didn't kind of stop there because that is only one big part, obviously, of what we do. However, a really big, another big part of what we do is um, where do we fit? Uh, where, where are we on the spectrum when it comes to the media landscape? And what are some, who are some of these, you know, critical actors that we really need to kind of develop some really deep relationships with, um, you know, actors that are producing content um, to challenge gender stereotypes in MENA uh, that similarly want to target the movable middle and how can we actually collaborate deeper, but how do we expand on that by, you know, also going, for example, to university campuses using the content that we produce and pushing the message out there with our movable middle uh, you know, audience, because what we realized is that we have to get to that movable middle so that we can build a catalyst. So it's not just us and the work that we do, but almost ambassadors of young people in the region um, who are responding and who are able to kind of take uh, you know, these topics and kind of push them back into their own, um, you know, communities into the, and into their own, um, uh, you know, communities, whether it's it's families or whether it's, you know, mm -hmm. friends, colleagues, etc. So this is really quickly about, you know, um, how we've went about it, particularly at Womanity. Thank you so much, Rana. Um, I want to welcome Cheryl because I see that Cheryl has just joined us. Um, welcome, Cheryl, to, to our panel today. Um, everyone, just Cheryl is the president of Echoing Green and I really wanted to start um, uh, actually to go next to, to you Cheryl to ask this question around you know building on what Rana said about uh, this focus on scaling deep um, where we focus on changing norms and behaviors in society because it's going to have on, on next generations you know, as Echoing Green is one of the major support organizations in the impact ecosystem. And, you know, as your, you know, as a, as a fellow yourself from 1992, when you started the Family Van, which is the community-based health unit in Boston, um, very much a social entrepreneur in your own right. One of the questions we have is, you know, when Echoing Green is considering fellows to support both with uh, seed funding and and leadership development. How have you been able to incorporate the concept of scaling deep impact into your decision making as an organization? Great. Well, thank you for that question, and thank you all for having me. I'm really excited to join uh, the conversation. And apologies for being a few uh, minutes late. Um, so, no, I think it's a wonderful uh, question and a wonderful framing. And I'll just maybe start with some contextual comments um, and a reminder for those who may not be uh, necessarily familiar with Echoing Green's work. Um, and uh, we have really long seen the potential of social innovation as a really powerful cross-sector alliance-based approach um, to ending racial and class injustice, um, really adding to the arsenal of other time-tested strategies like community organizing, activism, advocacy, and in sort of reading through, I think the lovely definition and thinking around scaling deep, which is fundamentally about changing hearts and minds, um, sort of the transformation and recognition of broken and oppressive systems that impact beliefs and values. You know, for us, that's very much aligned with the work of social justice, you know, this idea of fighting for systematic fair treatment of all peoples. Uh, that results in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all. And it's just sort of a reminder and again, sort of um, context setting that Echoing Green has really been focused on driving social innovation sort of squarely at the intersection of social justice. And we're laser focused then on identifying and investing in a very particular type of social 
Um, and again, I think it lines up very well with this thinking around scaling deep. So sort of a particular set of leadership abilities. Um, you know, not just EQ and IQ, but also sort of SEQ, what we talk about social and entrepreneurial intelligence, but a real focus on the concept of, of value, both value creation and value consideration. And it's a reminder that, you know, across societies, we everything. Um, and this notion of attaching different conceptions to others and enshrining socially constructed assumptions about all sorts of folks. And normally this really sort of shows up and manifests as a devaluation and often marginalization of particular groups. You know, we're very much of a moment sort of interrogating this ideology of white supremacy uh, that manifests as structural racism. So this idea um, that social entrepreneurs see value and opportunity where most others see only challenge. There's an opportunity to really shift reality, shift norms, shift perceptions by working with folks who really transform these long-held assumptions um, and really build from a fundamental considerations of people's inherent worth and value and boundless potential. Um, so again, that's very much enshrined in how we um, identify, search for, and select uh, social innovators within our community. And I think last but not least, sort of this notion of social innovation being very much focused on an alliance-based approach to tackling problems. So sort of, again, sort of the sine qua non of the work of social innovation about sort of blurring sectoral boundaries in a way that creates, again, this concept of new and fair public value. Um, so again, whereas the framing and construction and terminology around scaling deep um, is really a new sort of framing for the equity green community, I think it's very, very much aligned um, with the way that we think about the type of leader in which we invest. And I'll say the last thing that is in some ways um, somewhat unique to the work of Echoing Green is I think the concept of scaling deep and deep impact for us is very much related to the notion of proximity um, and the importance of finding leaders who are proximate to not only the communities in which they're working, but the solutions um, that are necessary for those communities. When we look globally, about 75% of our uh, leaders are in fact proximate. Um, and there's something about um, systems impacted folks who have a particular frame and lens on the kind of transformational work around norms, values, and beliefs um, that is just essential um, to moving systems and transforming systems in very powerful ways. So I think we're very much aligned with this concept of scaling deep impact. Thank you so much, uh, Cheryl. Um, because I know we have a, a lot to get through, I wanna jump straight to, to Teresa. Um, Teresa is a, a, a social entrepreneur in her own right, but she's also uh, a lecturer in Yale. She even wrote a textbook on social entrepreneurship. She has in her spare time somehow found the space to even have a podcast on innovation and impact. And she set up the first venture philanthropy organization in her home country in Lebanon. And she also started the first social entrepreneurship program in the context of public health at Harvard. So I would argue that you are our academic expert on this panel. And therefore, I'd love to ask you the question, Teresa, of, you know, with, with every insight that you have gained of what works and what doesn't in social innovation, what have you noticed in terms of trends in the sector that are supporting the franchise models, so the scaling out? Um, and what social innovations have you observed that are being most impactful and do they align with the trends that you have observed? Teresa, if we can't hear you. Sorry, Teresa, I think there's something with the, we can't hear you. I forgot to unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nikki, um, and thank you, everyone. I wouldn't consider myself uh, an academic expert, but I'm definitely a big nerd who likes to learn as much as she can, and I'm driven by learning, so um, I'll, I'll definitely share what I've observed. 
um, and my training is in public health, specifically the social and environmental determinants of health, which we're trying to move away from that language, but just thinking about drivers of health, which I know that these things are on everyone's mind right now in terms of health is not only about health delivery, but also about health equity and racial equity and all the things that Cheryl mentioned. And so since, you know, we're living in this COVID world and, and the title of the panel is about COVID, I think I'll, in thinking about your question and in thinking about the trends, I will focus mostly on COVID since that's the biggest mover of trends and drivers of health these days. And I think that this could be an opportunity to shift away from the trends that have absolutely been supporting scaling out, like the rise of impact investing and all the buzz around impact investing, which by definition requires us to say we've reached X people and, you know, we, we want to increase our social return on investing. So when comparing two social entrepreneurs, we're going to pick the one that has reached millions. I mean, the kinds of social entrepreneurs that we work with in Lebanon are people with leaders with lived experience, which Cheryl used the word proximity to describe. A woman who was born and raised, a Palestinian woman who was born and raised inside a Palestinian refugee camp, who leads a community-based organization working in this Palestinian refugee camp, she's never going to solve the geopolitical issues or reach all the refugees, but she's really concerned with scaling deep. And she'll never see a drop of the huge amounts of money that have been allocated towards impact investing because she won't generate those big numbers and she won't even know how to communicate with those investors and, and get her message out and they'll never hear about her. But when we invest in a venture like hers, we're, we're changing what's possible, even if it's only a small number of women just to give a small example, since it's accessible, and if anyone wants to check it out, there's a documentary about it called Sufra, S-O-U-F-R-A, that's available on Hulu, that talks about their work. I mean, even if it's only a small group of women that showed that something was possible, something so simple like starting a food truck for refugee women in Lebanon, if they're able to do it, they're not changing everything in the world, but they're changing who participates in the market. And they are changing perceptions, not only of the host community towards them, but even within their community about what a woman can do. And even within their children about what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a refugee. And so that trend of supporting ventures that scale out through impact investing is one of the trends that had concerned me to answer your question about trends that were supporting scaling out and the impact metrics that capture that kind of scale. And there were already innovations that helped shift away from that, like the impact management project and other collaborations that were thinking about measuring other levels of impact. And, and we have done some work through an Al Fanadiel collaboration that's now on hold because of the pandemic, thinking about how can you measure different things like agency and how can that carry weight in helping to really capture the impact. But I think to shift my focus to COVID-19, now during this moment of time, everyone really, really cares about racism, you know, um, and about social justice issues that have always been there and yet have not been at the forefront of everybody's minds. And there's an anger and a restlessness in people who have not been involved in social innovation and don't really need to be involved in social innovation because they're involved in the status quo, right? So social entrepreneurs know about racism and social justice and people who support them know about it. But the people we really need to know about it are the people who are, have been just benefiting from and perpetuating the status quo, even if they do care about others and they do care about change. And I think the fact that we've activated all those people, and if we can somehow create connections with that anger and that restlessness and that desire, that's going to be the biggest trend that's going to support scaling deep because there are solutions.
there are leaders with lived experience inside the communities that are racism and other drivers of health. And we don't need to ideate the solutions or innovate the solutions. We just need to listen to them and follow them and stop trying to be leaders and just be followers. And that's the best way to scale deep. So I'll stop there because I just, that's the main trend that I'm hoping will support scaling deep. And it's not an innovation, it's just a trend. <laughs> Thank you so much, Teresa. I think it's a really great segue to Nestle Rexen because Nestle's the CEO and founder of, um, of Fox Philanthropy, which is a leading fundraising um, strategy firm. It's a registered B Corp and Nestle has been leading the way, helping fundraising capacity for NGOs for years. You know, providing trainings and convenings around the world, including being a contributor to ecosystems like the Skull World Forum or the World Economic Forum. And she's a woman moving millions members. She is also a gender lens angel investor herself and a member of the Funders Pledge. And so, Nestle, listening to what Teresa is saying and, and kind of building on what Cheryl was saying as well, is your organization works to accelerate the effectiveness in solving complex global issues and really through these effective fundraising strategies. So do you see the scaling out being characterized as the sole way of successful impact among not-for-profit and funding stakeholders? And if not, what are those tools and approaches that women, like Teresa mentioned, um, you know, could adopt towards strategically communicating that deep impact to potential funders? Sorry, Natalie, we can't hear you. I don't know, maybe the, just needs to be Sorry. unmuted. Voila, how about, how about now? Hmm, hmm, hmm. You can hear me? Oh, perfect, perfect. It's, there's a bit of a delay even on my side now. Um, so apologies. And uh, in answer to your question, I don't see scaling out as the sole form. I do think it has its place. Um, but I think building a solid foundation from which to scale out is the bigger priority in this era of profound reckoning. Um, and I think that foundation can be truly solid through scaling deep first and foremost. And what I mean by that is with this vital new foundation from which we rebuild needs to be informed by awakened leadership, um, a wise inner compass that recognizes that at a deep core level, uh, we're all connected. And I was on a, uh, a call last night with New England International Donors, the, the, the funders involved with that organization, and there was a quote that came up in one of the conversations, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other, and that's Mother Teresa. And so what that brings up for me is, you know, during the pandemic, how do we show up for each other, recognizing we're connected? Um, there are countless nonprofit leaders who flung open their doors, pulled back the veil on their models, became open source in terms of not only sharing content, but developing content so that other organizations could uh, scale out and deeply more rapidly. Um, you also see it in open source with organizations uh, like uh, Skull World Forum, for example, they pivoted to virtual uh, convening within three weeks. And what that did, which I thought was so exciting, was um, it made content available to, to literally 10,000 people, 10,000 organizations looking to make deep and lasting change. But if they didn't have scaling deep as their culture and as their part of their DNA, they wouldn't be able to pivot on a dime in that way. So I'm kind of giving examples of organizations who already were living and breathing this and how they're the ones thriving and showing up for communities. Uh, in our case, you know, the very first question for, for, from me to our team is who's in struggle? 
who's financially struggling, you know, what does it need to look like internally to support all of our team members? And literally not one of our team members said, please give me more work. Every single one said, if someone else is in more need, please give them more projects, bigger projects. So again, that's part of a culture, that's part of a DNA, it's part of a B Corp DNA, in fact, and there's over 3,300 B Corps around the world growing very rapidly. And it's, it's, it's those are the organizations who have diversity as a core value, not only in their leadership, but on their boards. And the data shows those organizations are performing better financially, better morale, better company, better employee retention, all of these uh, drivers that encourage well-doing and well-being. Um, another example that I, I got an email from uh, Kristen Hall yesterday. She's also in Women Moving Millions and she founded NIA Global Solutions. And so Teresa, you were talking about impact investing. So I don't know the exact, actually, I will pull up the exact numbers because it was so, so impressive what, what her results came up as. And um, so investing with a gender lens, uh, with a uh, public market focus on well-being, well-doing, the NIA portfolio returned close to 38% for the second quarter in comparison to the S&P 500, which returned 20.5%. Uh, their year to date is up 14% with the S&P 500 down negative 3.09. Um, so as of yesterday, when I when I got this email from her, um, the portfolio returned 24.13 year to date. So moving investments to a firm like NIA or Pax Elevate Global Women's Fund or things along those lines, I think it's it's an example of of I mean every time that you move one dollar. From your wallet to another wallet, it's a it's a transfer of power. But what we're what we're seeing is it's not only positive for our own investments and the financial game, but it's actually better for the world. Um, and investing in these companies that are scaling deep are just outperforming the ones who are in those old structures. And I think it's a, it's a dying. Um, rotted root system that that needs to shift. I think humanity, I, I think there's a great deal at stake if it doesn't shift. Um, I do think with the old guard and the old systems, I think it's going to be a monkey knife fight to get it to shift forward um, in a way, but I, I, I don't see any other way forward. And fortunately to do with the, your question to do with measurement and how do we report out, there's the data. There are just some of those examples of uh, not only it being um, just really solid business sense, it's just great for humanity. And so again, kind of pointing to Nia, pointing to B Corps, where they're measuring people and planet long before profit, and yet the profit's there. Um, I, I, just the evidence is so powerful that there's no other way forward. And we're at a point where it's kind of a choiceless choice at this Point. We're sort of on the brink of a demise or an incredible new rebirth. And what I love about Wiser and, and, and this whole series is I do have a core belief that the future hinges upon a more just and close, inclusive and gender balanced world. And, uh, and, and, and we all have masculine and feminine. But I also have to point to womanity and Jan Borkstedt, you know, Rana's uh, representing womanity. And he and I met also through Women, Women Moving Millions. And, you know, men are holding up the other half of the sky. And we need them in the conversation, in lockstep. And I will say fathers of daughters are some of the fiercest warriors of all for gender equality, who are making these decisions at the C-suite level about bringing more and more diversity, gender diversity, racial diversity, all of it. Um, not only is it the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. So much. Um, I'd love to move on to Marin Bengora. Marin is the executive director of the Chanel Foundation. So she's worked in the space for over 20 years, working in international NGOs, as well as the United Nations, where she's managed several maternal and infant health projects in Latin America and Africa. And Lauren, working her, having worked in the philanthropic space, NGO, and then international government levels, 
How do you believe that all these subsections of the innovation sector can come together to advance scaling deep as a model for impact? You know, nationally reflected on the, the role that corporations play. Um, but having kind of this this um, this role that you've and the experience that you've had across the sectors, where do you see the the collaboration opportunities and what do you believe needs to shift in the wider ecosystem for social impact to truly be considered this valuable return on investment? Well, thank you. Thank you to Iman and to the entire Shaka Arab World team. This is an incredible opportunity for Fondation Chanel also to uh, reflect with you and all the uh, amazing speakers today. Um, I have to say, I indeed jumped from different universes, uh, moving from NGO field work in Africa and Latin America uh, into this very exquisite world of philanthropy, uh, which has its own values and own uh, mindset. And I think we're also facing in the philanthropy world a shift of mindsets that hopefully will be beneficial to the wider um, NGO sector and social enterprise sectors. Um, as we know, um, there are too many silos. I think just put it out as a first statement. Uh, there are even silos within the sector of philanthropy, as we know, between uh, long-standing private uh, orga foundations, organizations driven by individual donors, uh, compared to corporate uh, philanthropies, we tend to see the world in different uh, frameworks. And so what we've tried to do, uh, since we're a generalist organization uh, moving the intention of advancing women's lives and girls' lives uh, in, uh, in advancing their role in society, uh, what we hope to do is to just break those silos somewhat by creating a common language. Uh, and how have we learned to do this over time is very much first and foremost, as many of you have said, to listen to the to the groundbreaking work that is done at grassroots level is to listen to the leaders in communities to bring out the best practices that stem from all these different contexts and to try to bridge the good practices between continents and oftentimes to make them understood. Uh, to donors who don't necessarily dare to move into the gender space. We're assuming here, because we're all gender advocates, that it's an obvious place to operate in, but we all know how much resistance can be faced when you start uh, discussing the role of uh, equality between men and women, or even women's rights as a whole. Uh, when you uh, address donors who come from an education perspective or a health perspective exclusively, uh, let alone those who uh, move around much more territorial or community-based uh, locally driven initiatives. So what we would recommend uh, to break those silos and to scale deep, since that is the topic today, is to ensure um, we identify the appropriate roles for each of these organizations throughout the spectrum. And I heard that also coming from you, Cheryl, and, I, and I've been so lucky to meet with Echoing Green uh, colleagues and leaders around the world, is to just say, we're all moving towards the same objective. However, we all have different added values in this spectrum. And I think what philanthropy can do is be the seed uh, drivers, be the early adopters of certain practices and to support those leaders in the very risky stages of development, uh, which even Ashoka is now doing, but initially so, was more recognized as an organization that would catch those social enterprises once they were already kind of nicely packaged and with a, an amazingly charismatic leader at their helm. And oftentimes it tended to be a man. So what we're really excited to see is that an organization that has the influencing power uh, like Ashoka, but so many others now who are entering the social enterprise space are capable of going and digging out through incubating processes and programs, through uh, calls for proposals, etc., and prizes to try to dig out those extremely valuable gems that sometimes are just an idea. They haven't actually become a, 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 an enterprise yet. Uh, and that has been an amazing experience learning from some of these uh, incubation programs 
that we've um, spearheaded, uh, namely from France and with the support of INCO, if you know them, INCO is a, a social impact incubator from France. They've been working uh, towards pushing for uh, female entrepreneurs from around the world also to be better recognized in our environment here in Europe. Uh, so this is to say how to bridge the gap is to try to find appropriate roles, but also to acknowledge that there is still very little dedicated funding uh, available for um, gender specific initiatives. Uh, the OECD conducted a, a large review with 150 uh, philanthropic organizations just a year ago, and it appeared that only 16% of that money was directed towards uh, women's issues as a whole, most of which was reproductive health and very little dedicated to uh, mindset change, norms change, uh, etc. So we need to ensure we build the proper measurement system that will allow for those donors to understand the value. And I, I really will uh, be eager to hear from all your experiences as to uh, how to create that narrative, build the bridges between regions, between organizations, and events like this one are, are very valuable in that sense. Thank you so much, Marin. Um, next, we have Elizabeth White, the woman to hold the first woman to hold the position of director of the British Council in Egypt. Prior to joining the British Council, she built extensive international experience in the field of education, working in Ecuador, Ukraine, Yemen, Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Syria, to just name a few countries. Elizabeth is keen on promoting the British Council's initiatives and programs in the field of education, science, and English, which are the main pillars of the British Council's work in Egypt. And we are very proud to, to have the British Council's support of WALS. But Elizabeth, how do you aim to leverage the power of the British Council to truly foster this scaling deep growth in Egypt? And you know, building on what Marin said about building bridges, you know, what methodologies have you found to be truly successful in maintaining buy-in um, in Egypt in the programs that the British Council is leading? Thank you, Nikki, and thank you, everybody. I'm um, honored to be here, slightly abashed to be here among so many experts. I'm, I'm super proud to be the first woman director of the British Council in Egypt in 80 years. It, believe me, it took us a long, long time. And I'm very much aware of the responsibility that brings to the women and girls that we work with in my team and in the wider world in Egypt, <clears throat> and my duty to the women who will come after me. I'm, um, I will, Nikki, I will answer your question, but first, if you'll allow me a little bit of a detour, because I've been thinking a lot about your topic, about scaling deep. I've been thinking about metaphors and about the language that we use to give reality to the concepts that we live by. Because in almost every language, in almost every culture, there's a powerful basic metaphor which says that up is good. We higher things are better than lower things. Things are getting better, they're looking up. When we're happy, our spirits rise. Things are good, they're on the up and up. When the opposition goes low, we go high, and it's a good thing to do. We rise up, we wise up, we start up, we shape up, we build up, we scale up. And these are all good things because up is good. But when you disrupt the metaphor, when you subvert it, you make people think. We're no longer thinking only about scaling up or scaling out. We're now talking about scaling in a different direction, about scaling deep. And deep, as a metaphor, implies roots and wisdom and time. We dig deep to find the truth. Still waters run deep. Beliefs are deep-rooted. She is a deep character, admirably deep. Deep is what lasts. And we all want to have the chance and the reach and the time to make a lasting difference. And this, I hope, is a metaphor which we will, which we will live by. Um, you, the, the way that we've been working with um, uh, Ashoka over the last year and a bit is um, under a program that we call DICE, which is one of our most ambitious. We call DICE, which stands for Developing Inclusive and Creative Economies. 
um, I'm aware of the fact that in Egypt, Dice doesn't only mean our program. It's a, actually a popular brand of underwear. We didn't decide the name, but um, we rise high up above the jokes because Dice is a, a program which we've been operating for two years. And the aim is to stimulate the creative and social enterprise economy, an area of economic development that mixes culture, creativity, technology and entrepreneurship. And what's special about this is the link between the opportunities inherent in, uh, in creative and social enterprise and the commitment to ensuring that those opportunities are inclusive, are created by and for and with disadvantaged and marginalized groups. And the program works or begins to work at any rate, or I hope begins to work because it operates on three layers of intervention. The first bringing together government actors, national institutions and universities and organizations to work on promoting the creative economy and social enterprise sector. The second working directly with social and creative businesses and organizations, including Ashoka, to, do, to understand and develop the market in Egypt. And the third, providing grants to individuals to kickstart projects. Um, because by supporting the young creative and social entrepreneurs and working with policymakers and intermediaries to create the beginnings of an, an ecosystem which they can thrive, we take a whole system approach which should, we hope, reach deep and which will be long lasting. Um, we're particularly proud of this, of the work that's been done by and with the young uh, change makers, the 60 amazing young women that we worked on with the Shoka. And their final presentations made a very deep imp impact on me. In, in general, for the British Council, we're a long term organisation and our work is about change rather than about numbers. And this means that in principle, we are able to scale, to plan for deep scale, deep reach, deep impact. And we recognize that change is needed to support women and girls' awareness, capacities, abilities, and create opportunities and an enabling environment for empowerment. But how does this translate into in today's world, in the world which we have all been living in for the last four months now? As my impressive colleagues here on this panel have pointed out, this time of change is a time of immense promise and immense danger too. Natalie said that the future hinges on what happens now, and you're very right. There is risk and there is danger, but there is also great hope and great possibility. This panel and the whole Wise Up event has shown us how widespread is that hope, how deep are its roots. I'm proud to be part of this group. I look forward to seeing how we shall all now and in the future scale deep and rise high. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was beautiful. Um, I think it's pertinent to kind of go to our to our final panelist um, now. Uh, Abdullah Rahman Alawani is program manager at the Asfari Foundation, and he is an ally and a major supporter of gender justice in all its forms. He manages the youth programming at Asfari Foundation, which is a grant-making charity that invests in and supports the sustainability and a resilient and empowered civil society. He has also managed research projects encouraging female employment in Saudi Arabia and completed his master's in sustainable international development with a focus on gender justice and women empowerment. So, just building actually on, on everything that has been said, um, and especially focusing in on, on Elizabeth's point, you know, to, to have deep impact and to create these bridges and collaborations, you know, that is based on if we have trust between one another. And so trustful partnerships is, you know, what makes or breaks um, a collaboration. And so how, in the methods that you use as the Asfari Foundations, what methods have you used for identifying and pursuing impactful partnerships uh, in terms of understanding if there's values alignment there and, and trust? Um, thank you for that. Uh, I'm proud to be here. Uh, it's very difficult to kind of follow up after all those amazing presentations from all uh, the presenters. I think it would be good to start with telling you a little bit of a story about the Asfari Foundation and how uh, working with formidable women who manage the foundation have led to our shift to focus on uh, scaling deep. 
a couple of years ago or three years ago, we looked at our strategy to kind of see how we uh, support the civil society infrastructure that we work with and innovative youth. Previously, we used to have a very project projectized approach, working, focusing on the clients or the end users with the training that we're delivering, with the support that we're offering. But from reflecting on our programming and talking to our partners and uh, trusted partners on the ground, we realized that we should shift from focusing to short intervention projects to focusing more towards long-term impact, focusing not on the clients or end users, but focusing on the organizations that support them, for them to be able to kind of look internally uh, and build uh, uh, the organizational development to be more robust uh, and sustainable for the future and continue to do the uh, scaling deep work that they do. So we had a shift in strategy. We started, instead of funding projects, we started funding organizations. And the majority of our funding goes towards organizational development, not necessarily programmatic activities. And in that, we, it, it, took a, it took a mindset shift with our partners as well to how they think in a way that it's not projectized. It's not about programs. It's not about delivery, but to think internally of how, what areas they need to focus on, what areas they need, need to improve, how they need to uh, be stronger in some uh, um, uh, capacities to be able to kind of continue to deliver the work that they're doing. And in that, uh, with the discussions that we have, we understand that projects will not solve problems. It will be collaborations and it will be kind of working collectively with various stakeholders to touch on uh, Mirren's point to kind of uh, um, building collaboration. So we encourage uh, our network of partners to come together to, in, in working um, in our focus on uh, OD as well and investment in me. Um, we have values. We've always led our work for the past 14 years with values. But it's very, it's very important to take a step back and to see if we're living by those values. We, see, we talk about diversity. We talk about uh, uh, professionalism and excellence. We talk about inclusion. So in our strategic shift a couple of years ago, we took a step back and we looked, how can we live those um, uh, values? In our building block, when we were doing the um, uh, business uh, uh, canvas, we looked at what is our kind of unique selling model and how can we build those trusted relationships with our partners and kind of focus on the values that we're working on. We truly look at our relationship with our partners as partnerships, not necessarily as a, we want to challenge the narrative of a donor grantee uh, relationship or focusing only on reporting, focusing only on delivery. We have a very hands-on approach where we work collectively together because the success of our partners is our success. Um, so we have a very friendly approach when we're working with our partners. Uh, we do have extensive uh, knowledge of the region. Most of us in the office are from the region as well. Uh, but with that in mind, we take a step back. We know we're based in London. We are slightly departed from what's happening. So in our, in our discussions, in our working relationships, um, we know that our partners are the experts and they, are, they have the know-how and they have the expertise and the contextual knowledge. We're only just the catalyst for the amazing change that they want to kind of deliver in the region. We believe in the local movement. We support local organizations, grassroots level organizations. Uh, we believe in localization and that leads part of the relationships that we have and uh, kind of, adds to the partnership building that we work with our partners because we trust in local knowledge. We trust that they have the know-how and the ability. We work with international experts as well, but to kind of adapt and contextualize some of their learning and some of their knowledge to the local uh, context. Um, and uh, yeah, and we have a very hands-on approach, as I was mentioned. Uh, and working with our partners and having a network of very expert, uh, with high expertise and years and years of uh, delivery in the region uh, and kind of the, the localities and communities. We uh, focus on part of the collaboration building and the bridging uh, that was mentioned earlier on how we can amplify their solutions. Uh, how can we uh, invest in uh, the knowledge industry that we have in, among our network of partners? So within our relationship with them, we focus a lot on sharing, building on knowledge sharing and learning. And with that, uh, recently with the strategy shift that we had, we started building uh, a portal that can amplify the solutions that happen from uh, local to global. And similar to the earlier discussion, the session before this, uh, the focus on the South-led narrative. How can we amplify the solutions that are taking happening on the local ground, uh, on the kind of uh, the local level, instead of someone sitting in London or someone sitting in DC deciding the new strategy for the region. How can we share those uh, experiences? And not, not only to kind of have that South-led narrative, but to also understand we operate in Lebanon and Palestine, uh, supporting the Levant primarily. 
Um, but the, the issues that are facing the Levant or Lebanon specifically at the moment are not very different from the issues that are facing in Egypt or Libya or like Yemen. There is a lot of a lot of knowledge that could be shared and kind of and in that and the relationship that we have with our partners, we focus on how can we amplify those solutions so others can benefit from them in different contexts. So much. Now we have another 25 minutes and I'm going to to cut us at 20 minutes to leave another five minutes for a closing by Iman. But for 20 minutes, I'd love to open the floor to all of you and to kind of go back to this question of, you know, don't waste a good crisis. Um, can we, you know, as we are rebuilding our societies in the aftermath of this pandemic, and even now, you know, we really do have this unique opportunity to shift this ecosystem. And what, and, and feel free, you know, anyone to raise their hand and, and go, but what actions do we think we need to take in terms of taking advantage of this opportunity right now? And I might just have to hand it over to someone. Rana, you were smiling. Oh, Cheryl. Okay, sorry, I will just say that, um, you know, it's interesting. I was trained as a, a medical professional and spent a lot of time um, working in public health and uh, wonderful um, Yale scholar, Frank Stone, Snowden, who is sort of the preeminent scholar around epidemics and society and sort of talks about the role of pandemics in society as sort of this bifurcated opportunity, right? So these moments of transformation or um, they can sort of undergird or amplify sort of the structural inequities um, that are always amplified during these moments. So I think we've got a, a, a choice um, in this moment to either lean into the potential transformational uh, moment around addressing some of these structural inequities that were uh, and continue to be so highly amplified. You know, in the U.S., we're dealing um, with the um, devastating toll of essential workers of color who are just being ravaged by this disease. Um, and what we see time and time again uh, in moments like these, if we don't take the positive transformational approach, is that on the other side of these opportunities, you actually see moments of retrenchment and further underinvestment and disinvestment in communities that were most deeply impacted. So I think we've got to stay very, very, very focused. And I think sort of social innovators um, that are represented um, uh, on this call um, have to constantly be reminding the sector that this is a moment to um, over-invest in communities who have been on the front line since day one of this crisis, providing additional supports to these communities. So I just wanted to make sure that we're um, holding up the voices, the lives, the work of those um, who will be in community long after everyone goes back to quote unquote, whatever this new normal looks like. And I think that's a really important perspective that we all have to keep in mind in this moment. Thank you. Verona, did you want to say? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was, and I was laughing, Nikki, because when you said don't waste a good crisis, Mina seems to always have a crisis. So pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, we've had an elongated <laughs> period of a crisis after crisis. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, I was just laughing at that because um, although that is true, um, it is, ha this happening at a global level is almost kind of, um, you know, to an extent feels like it's equalizing um, or not equalizing, but actually bringing the perspective entirely to the entire world. Whereas before, um, you know, I guess it was hard to kind of bring forth, um, you know, all the inequalities, all the system, uh, you know, systematic issues that are, you know, fundamentally wrong. Um, but it was mostly kind of more geography region specific and it was almost hard to kind of um, paint the full picture of how this actually really feels like. Um, and all of a sudden kind of sitting from Mina watching the world, the entire world, uh, you know, going through it, you're like, ah, oh, you know, same boat, different stories, uh, because we know that uh, it's, it's, you know, different stories, but we are in the same boat. And so it almost got this like, all of a sudden, this collective uh, empathy. Uh, you know, this collective, um, you know, 
we finally can collectively relate uh, because everyone uh, globally is going through something and is going through a crisis and everyone can now actually understand and feel what it, you know, what it means to be in, in crisis mode and what it means to kind of operate, uh, you know, from that perspective and more specifically because, you know, we're talking or we've been talking about gender, but more specifically for women as well. So now I feel like that is just, um, a, and this is why I think this uh, this time is uh, th this particular crisis is a unique opportunity because we can finally almost all relate. Um, and I think just to really echo what has been you know said here, um, we are you know we have this one opportunity at really listening. So kind of and and that came with the pandemic as well. And then you know the whole you know start of the pandemic was like okay let's just all reflect inwards and let's go internal and. And I think that this is more than individual. This is this is you know kind of more globally, uh, and this is about how we do things. And and kind of listening and reflecting is all taking it back to grassroots. Uh, what are we able to do, um, you know, at a grassroots level within our own communities? But the big question is how are we able uh, to collectively, globally enable uh, that to happen? How are we able to kind of commit uh, to supporting? grassroots leaders and grassroots organizations, small and big, how do we collectively start working together? I think, you know, personally, one of the things that we are looking at for the future at Womanity is how do we do things with others? Uh, because this is, um, you know, we just can't keep going on and working, um, you know, inside. We are, you know, kind of collectively and individually, sorry, individually working on different issues, but have we actually really pooled um you know our efforts and pulled our resources the capacity that we could we definitely haven't um so for me it is about kind of this whole experience has been about making sure or or has ensured that everyone gets it we actually know um you know what a global crisis looks at and, and we finally can can uh, talk about experiences that we can all relate to um so that has been a crucial a crucial starting point and from there onwards is now everyone is looking at how can we actually locally um, start kind of uh, solving some of these problems um, and getting that massive support behind the local action. We think globally, but we act locally. So th that is now becoming a reality. The think globally, act locally is for me, the pandemic is, is the opportunity to actually make that happen. Uh, and I think that's where we, we are going to play our role. Thank you, Rana. You know, it also makes me think, it, actually to Elizabeth's point earlier, I think on um, what are the impact metrics? You know, that what is the, the standard that we can all hold ourselves to account for to then create those collaborations? Um, and I don't know, Elizabeth, this is something that you've, you've reflected on, uh, but in terms of those scaling deep methodologies and, and really methods for measuring that impact. What advice do you have? It's always a question, of course. Um, and um, there are probably as many answers to this question as the, as the times the question has been has been asked. As a um, an organisation um, which has to demonstrate the, uh, the the worth of the work that we're doing at every stage and almost more often than than than, than we have breakfast, then we um, have a number of measures for demonstrating that impact. But in the end, in the end, in the end, what, what we're looking if we're looking for deep impact, then it's a matter of time, and you can't skimp. You can't. You, you a snapshot is not going to get you anywhere convincing. But you have to simply be um, uh, consistent, be, um, uh, be simple on the whole, and to, to ensure that you have, um, that you, you actually scale deep in your impact measurement as well as in the work that you do. Yes, Abdullahan. I can add something here, and I think donors are to blame a little bit about uh, not incorporating scaling deep methodologies. Uh, the focus on uh, number of investees, their profit, uh, numeric indicators are important, of course. But I think there has to be a shift to focus on qualitative uh, indicators. Um, uh, 
uh, for donors to kind of start using that language and in the way they think about their visions, the way they think about their missions, their objectives, not in a way that it would be numerically and focused on kind of quantitative data, it would be focused also on uh, quantitative data. Uh, in our approach, we kind of, it's important to kind of think uh, about lean uh, metrics in a way that you have a, a, a mission and a vision, you, you set the work and you start recording indicators as the work progresses. Uh, unfortunately, again, donors uh, trained uh, us collectively to be uh, bookkeepers, not uh, uh, change makers. And the way that to focus on the lean uh, uh, impact measurement uh, would be important to support uh, scaling. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Nikki. Just want to jump in on one key idea here, which is uh, building on what Rana said. We're, we're shifting from a moment of time where things that were acceptable, the inequities, inequities and structural imbalances that we're seeing tend to become unacceptable. And that's the great thing that possibly we need to surf on. Uh, in civil society, it's happening in the media to a certain extent. Uh, but it's also happening within uh, industries and within corporations, uh, at least from our perspective here in, in France and what I hear from the US, uh, companies are pushed now into purpose-driven thinking and pushed into changing their mindset from being exclusively profit-making organizations into uh, citizens as much as other organizations should act. Uh, and in that sense, I think there definitely is leverage to support uh, not only from foundations, but especially those foundations like ours who are connected to a company to promote a, a change of mindset also within the company, building on all these learnings, the learnings on supporting organizational management and development rather than simply project-driven uh, achievements. Ensuring we build connections and we use our influence and communication power for positive messaging rather than for uh, stereotyped and repetitive uh, enforcement of, uh, let's say, old-fashioned world visions. And we need to ensure we build that belief into leadership and decision makers, both in you know, high-level uh, enterprise, uh, even all these young uh, seeds of enterprises that are uh, around us need to be led by people who are driven by these values of openness, uh, interaction, diversity, and inclusion, making sure that they embed those values in future ventures, rather than trying to correct those ventures that are still under former models. Uh, so there's uh, also a lot of advocacy that can be done uh, throughout all these different streams of work. Yeah. Nasty. Yeah, so uh, oh, Rana sorry. and Cheryl both. Can you hear me? I'm not on mute. Voila. Okay, great. Um, so Rana and Cheryl both touched upon how an old model of you know working in silos. And what I think we're finding, at least on the nonprofit side, is there are fewer and fewer resources. So to some extent, there's being um, organizations are being forced to collaborate. And then through that, a culture of collaboration is emerging more and more. And we know funders love to fund collaboration, but very often um, it's it's been not easy to kind of get there and how do we dovetail together where this is sort of forced uh, needing to do that, to get the funds they need to continue to do their work in the world. So one of the big shifts, one of my hopes is that this culture of collaboration and innovation does continue far beyond the pandemic. And I think that we're going to see that um, that it's more joyful, it's more love-based, it's more, uh, to Mira's point, more transparent. And um, it moves everything forward. And why would you turn back from that once you've tasted that fruit? So true. Another um, theme that brings, you know, when we speak to to company CEOs, it's, you know, how can you have a, a company that's thriving if the ecosystem that you rely on is dying? You know, I think you need to shift mindsets um, and mindsets around that and, and everyone to play their role as the societal stakeholder. Um, so in terms of in building on this theme of collaboration, um, you know, we in order to bring about collaboration, there is a shift in paradigm of what success looks like that needs to happen. Um, 
what is it that you have as advice for the different stakeholder groups that are listening in? We have representatives from government or companies, CSR managers or social entrepreneurs or young Ashoka change makers. What's the advice? How do we bring about this paradigm shift in terms of success? Well, I'll, 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 I'll chime in. Maybe it's more philosophical, but I do think one of the one of the, the some of the goal that's come out of this is not. I mean, so let's face it, we're all very action oriented. When we see something that's heartbreaking, we have agency and we and we'll take action. But this has forced a lot of us to instead sit with the pain and be reflective and, and go into that inner wisdom and respond from, from, from that place, which is far more um, heart-centered and inclusive and, and collaborative. And so um, I think the advice is, you know, we, we can't lead while we're bleeding and broken, right? We need to be able to come from a place of, of healing, reconciliation, and, and from that place together, move forward um, as a collective. And I think that, you know, if we get this right, our children will not only inherit our hearts and vision for the world, but also our bravery in, in making it a reality. Um, and that gives me uh, that gives me great hope as I see uh, the, the little faces and the teen faces and my daughter and her peers, they're watching, they're watching every minute. And they're not only watching, they're actually showing up in the work as well and doing it ugly, but nonetheless showing up with um, their form of brilliance and their incredible solutions and, and innovations that we couldn't begin to dream of because we're no, we're, we've kind of moved out of that dreamer space where that 10 year old is like point A, point B, why aren't you getting this? And the, the, the good thing is we're all paying attention and going, wow, you're right. And we're listening. So if we get this right, I think, I think uh, all of this can shift within one generation. I love to see it happen on my, on our watch and our generation, but certainly in the next generation. Yes. Just to build on, just to build on that, um, I think listening earlier or yesterday to the change, the young change makers discussions was a really moving part. You, you the the passion they have, the the aspirations they have, is something that should be amplified, and they kind of create role models for the future. And it begs the question for policymakers and government officials, especially in our region, who some are as old as the nation, to uh, kind of maybe make space maybe listen to youth a little bit more. Uh, the generation, the millennials, or generation Z or generation Y um, are much more tech savvy and much more like uh, aware of what's happening in the world because of social media and everything. So I think there has to be a discussion on making space for young people to kind of come and share their aspirations, come and kind of influence policy design, come and share their vision for the future, which I think is uh, usually not part of the discussion on policy making level or scaling deep, uh, sorry, on various types of scaling. And the other point is, um, I skip my mind now, uh, I wanted to mention. Um, I think I, also to kind of, it's wonderful to be here. We all aligned on what we are talking about. We all share the same vision. We all have the same approach. Uh, it's good to kind of encourage ourselves and others to look outside the bubble that we're in to invite others who will not necessarily agree with our perspective and find ways to kind of encourage them to be part of the dialogue. Um, and I think that that's something really important to uh, uh, as part of an opportunity for the future and, and response for the, a world post COVID as well. I'll just say look, good work that's been done around sort of inclusive entrepreneurship approaches that really takes an ecosystem approach to how we bring sort of new voices, um, new types of leadership to the table. And obviously, this is a totally intersectional conversation. I mean, I'm most familiar with the work that is done for people of color, but I think it cuts the exact same way for um, women leaders in this space. And it's just a reminder that it is a comprehensive um, holistic approach that is everything from you got to catalyze, you know, you all were just saying you got to get more early stage young folks into the pipeline that's vital and they will have much to say about how they want to build their future moving forward. You then have to really do the hard work of investing and in supporting 
high potential um, women leaders of promise who are ready to put their shoulder to the wheel. I think you've then got to demonstrate um, how to uh, capitalize and begin to scale the organizations run by these incredible women leaders. There's been plenty of research to show that, um, you know, they are, we are <laughs> terribly undercapitalized and begin until we begin to identify proof points and bright spots of how you do this investment and how you can leverage investment in these leaders to provide disproportionate impact will never get anywhere. I do think there's a strategic communications angle on this. We've got to begin to tell and share stories and begin the narrative change work that fundamentally shifts norms over time. And I think there's real work for all of us to do wherever we sit on building these geographically or sector specific ecosystems that really allows us to wrap our arms around these incredible leaders um, and to provide the sorts of um, ecosystems that allow them to thrive. And then again, um, I love the work that Ashoka has been doing around embracing complexity and working on changing funder behavior. We've got to change the behavior of enabling organizations and funders um, to get them to work in um, profoundly different ways. Um, and I think, you know, we all are coming together collectively to begin to do this. So I am hopeful that if we continue to, to work together in spaces like these, we can really get there. Thank you. You know what, I want to actually end on that note and say thank you so much to our panelists and hand over to Iman for our closing remarks. Hello, everyone. Yes. OK, great. Well, first of all, I mean, this is like my dream come true. Uh, Women Initiative for Social started one day in 2009, then, you know, in 2012. And then it resurfaced globally in 2018. So this is wonderful. So I, win, I want to thank you all. This is an incredible, incredible, incredible session. I, I wish you would listen to the other ones that you haven't listened to. We just had the uh, South-led uh, session before, like the Voices of the South and, and Southern Women's to impact the ecosystem. Uh, and we also had the Young Change Makers that Abed was speaking about. So it has been an incredible journey. So thank you again, all of you for being here. Um, and I also would like to thank all the people who have been listening to us and reading good numbers. Uh, and all of them who had questions or comments were coming back to you. We will not let you go. But I also would like to thank the Wise Up team. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without my team. I am very lucky. So I would like to thank Claire Davenport, Ivana Moriaitis, Minatalla Isa, and Ahmed Salem, Muhammad Ahmed Salem, whom I always call Salem only, uh, because he's my IT genius and guru. So I really, really would like to thank them because I wouldn't have done anything without them. However, saying this, I'm not however, uh, this is not the last session and not the last time you hear from us. Uh, you will hear from us more and more because Wise Up series is only part of the Wise Up, uh, of the Wise initiative. Uh, we just wanted to share with the world, with the policymakers, with the ecosystem, with the young, young people, men or women, all the types of generations, yeah, uh, we wanted to showcase how does it look like to scale deep? I'm a, I'm a serious believer in scaling deep um, and, and how it is done and how all the stories that we've been hearing for the last three days by wonderful women from everywhere in the world, that they have really longer and larger impact and in millions. If we want numbers, there are numbers. It's just that we don't present it this way because this is the ecosystem way of judging things. We will also have a round table with major players in the ecosystem to see how we can influence it and change the narrative about what success is. I agree, scaling out is important, of course, but, but we also need to add scaling deep and scaling up and to see and show the world the impact of it. Um, why is this a global initiative? So everybody on, on the table is invited because this is not just about the Arab world, it's about everywhere else. We will also have what we call the storytelling, uh, which is just more than a book. My young team members are going to develop something cool, uh, which will be interactive and we will tell the stories of our more than 200 leaders from across the world, uh, women leaders who have really had an impact and again, use what I call the key value indicator, not just the key performance indicator. So it's not that we only developed and disrupted the system by saying scaling deep and scaling out, which I'll speak about and what Elizabeth said, but we're also adding other things and, 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 and using other terms from other places like the key value indicator, because values and roots and 
and beliefs are important to affect generations in the future. Our stories the last three days of all these wonderful women showed also not only that they scale deep and out and up, but they also have a different methodology, but all uh, social entrepreneurs do that. They collaborate, they, they make the community buy in, and they also um, work within the system sometimes in order to change the system. And also like Cheryl was saying, proximity. I mean, this is the whole idea. They're in the system and they're trying to change it. Today, you wonderful, wonderful speakers, um, you're the enablers in the system. Uh, and, and this is important, and I'm so happy that we have all agreed. And it is important at the beginning to get all us to align, to align together uh, so that we can impact the other and larger ecosystem. Womanity, for example, and the effect of media, how it sets the agenda and how they are always, you know, the, you're, you're embedding the media in the local environment. And, and this is important because you're making the voices of those people in the local areas heard, but you're also exposing them to the world. So, and that is scaling deep. Scaling deep. Echo Green and Cheryl, I mean, I love Echo Green. Um, but the, the idea that scaling deep is changing the heart and the mind. The idea that your goal, the transformation of, of uh, repressive systems aligns with your goal to end injustice, and that's only done by changing values, by changing how our hearts, and like Natalie said, if we change in our hearts, our children will change in their hearts. But that's the whole point. Um, and, and also the, the notion of proximity, which I also believe in. Reza, who disappeared, I think what she said is brilliant, because I agree with it. Uh, but, it's, but COVID is an opportunity to shift away from scaling out only and as the only focus. Uh, what she said about the women with the cooking trucks is very important because, yes, if you work with proximity, you will know that if men see women driving a truck or, or producing or the children see that, then the perception of women changes. I've been an activist for women's rights for 23 years. Uh, so I know how changing perception is very important. Um, Natalie, scaling out, I love the idea that the foundation even of scaling out and your, your interest in numbers and how this is important, how, how the world is changing, the foundation of scaling out is scaling deep. We cannot scale out unless we scale deep. And I think this has been brilliant. And I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, we need to start by scaling deep in order to have impact for generations. And, and because of the businesses, they will not survive unless they have a stable market. Um, mm -hmm. If we have invested in scaling deep uh, against violence or terrorism or better education of social entrepreneurs and women or men who are trying to change mindsets or, mis or, or mm -hmm. misinterpretation of religion, then the markets would have been safe and stable and business would have flourished. So as all of you said, we cannot really work in, in silos. You know, and, and I really also agree with that. Myron, breaking the silos. I mean, and philanthropy be the drivers to support for early cycle social entrepreneurs. You don't know how close this is to my heart. Uh, I have witnessed all the young people in our parts of the world, you know, not, not being able to survive because of certain types of education. And I, and Ashoka, we created a small thing on the side so that we can help young people. But I agree with you. And I think we should support gender-led initiatives. I don't know where Elizabeth went, but I just wanted to, to know that I will steal her words. <laughs> because I love it. Yeah. I mean, because she said she thought that when we use the term scaling deep, we are subverting the system. And I don't love anything more than subverting any system. I like the idea when she said that, you know, scaling deep is deep is about roots and wisdom and time. And this is exactly what we're saying. Beliefs are deep rooted and deep is what lasts. We, and we need time and patience. And I think that's important. That is, in my opinion, is real social investment, real impact investment. You know, and, and I'll mm -hmm. talk about this. Abdul Rahman, what you are doing and how you, you stuck up with the NGOs and, and how you decided that you're going to skill deep in a different way and you're shifting the paradigm of just doing project based, you know, whatever initiative. If God, in all the religion said that projects have to be three years because I don't know where these three years came from. You know, I, you know, I have no idea, but I totally agree with you. We should really be much more, we should really involve and engage much deeper. So just to end, 
I, I again thank you, and I have three um, suggestions, not recommendations, uh, for for us as enablers to spread and and to continue this conversation. Uh, a, a very nice, wonderful man, uh, philanthropist in in, uh, in from Jordan, said that what we need is patient capital, you know. And I I know he likes business more than I do a little bit, but his name is Fadi Gandour, and he's a very close friend. But Patient capital is important. If you want to scale deep and affect generations, it takes time because you are changing minds and behavior. So we need patient capital. We need people to go out of the three year, whatever, you know, and, and, and think about it. Scaling up, we see, we see it as changing laws and policies. So we actually change the definition of the mainstream. And if we, Nikki at the beginning talked about Sue Riddle and, and how she affected the SDG goals by one action. By adding a goal on climate, millions will be saved and protected and governments are now following. And, and when Sue presents it, she presents, oh, yes, we contributed in changing the SDG goals. But it's much more than that. It has generations and generations of impact. And scaling out, which is dominant, is, of course, important, but not necessarily always in the social sector, the most impactful in all our cases. So if you are with us and with COVID and the, the racial nightmare that's happening, discrimination in, in the West, I think we all should ask and, 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 and ask governments and ask donors, mainly donors and investors and universities to think of scaling deep and to understand that it does have numbers and that it does have roots and it is about beliefs. So thank you again very much. And I hope to see you all in our next round table. Perfect. Thank you very Thank much. You. Everyone, this has been wonderful. Bye. 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 Bye.